Good morning, Ridgeline. How's everyone doing this morning? All right. Will you stand up while we worship God together? Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that faint are never enough. And you came along, you put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and thoughts. You've seen them all and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place Your mercy and grace Will find me again Yeah Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Nothing is better than you Oh, there's Turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only. gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies 
You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. How's everyone doing? Better? Yeah. Amen. All right. Say hello to somebody next to you. Good morning, ma'am. How are you? Good? Yeah, I need a volunteer to drink some of that water. I'm not going to be willing. Oot! Would you like to drink some of that water? Yes, ma'am. You volunteer? <laughs> As you make your way back to your seats, you may be seated. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Swanson. I'm the director of worship here at Ridgeline. And I'm dealing with a heck of a case of sinusitis right now. Anyone else dealing with allergies this weekend? Oh, good. I don't feel so alone. Well, welcome to Ridgeline again. If you're a guest, we're so honored that you decided to come and, and spend the day with us in the house of the Lord. Uh, those of you watching online as well, thank you so much for joining us, even online. If you are a guest, we have one small request of you, one, and that is that you would fill out a Connect card. Well, you can do that digitally by texting the word CONNECT to 303-900-1294. That's especially important for our guests online to text that number right there so that we can get in touch with you. If you are in the house, you can still get in touch with us digitally, but we also have a pen and paper out in the lobby where you can connect as well. And that just gives us a chance to make sure we're getting to know who you are, what your needs are, and also get a special gift to you as well just to say thank you for joining us. For the rest of us, as we continue in worship, I do have a request that we think about worshiping with our giving. Again, this is not for guests. This is for those who call Ridgeline home. We can give in a multi multitude of ways, three in particular on the screen. One is online, helpful for all of those viewing online, ridgelinecc.org slash give. You can also give via the app if you haven't downloaded that yet. Check out the Google Play Store if you're on Android devices or the App Store if you're on an Apple device. And you can just click on the Give tab and give your offering and tithes that way. Or you can also give via cash or text in the box in the back of the room. Or if you would like to do that later on in the week, you can always mail it directly to our office as well. So let's just say a quick prayer to welcome the Lord here, continue welcoming him, and to bless our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your presence and for your love. Thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you still desire to do, not just for us, but for those around us. And thank you for the blessing and the privilege of being used by you to, to bless others and to, to bring your blessing to others. Thank you for how you work through us. So God, be honored today. And we ask you to just come and bless our time and do what you would like to do. God, as we, as we give of tithes and offerings, I pray that you, you bless the giver. And God, as we give of time, I pray that you bless our time, Lord. And as we come to seek you, I thank you that your promise says that we will find you. So we love you, God, and we ask it all in the name of the Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. So... Uh, as you know, if you've been around for uh, a little bit, uh, on a monthly basis, we like to take the opportunity uh, to recognize one of our missionaries, to learn about what God's doing in the nations. Um, and this morning, we have the privilege to hear from one of our own. So I'm going to hand it over to Lon Stubiger. Hey, warm Ridgeline welcome for Lon. Good morning. <coughs> so I'm going to have a drink of water. So, uh, are my slides up? 
Well, um, while we're waiting for the slides to come up, uh, I have a couple of volunteers willing to come up and try some of this water. The most efficient use of mission money that I've ever seen. Uh, for $50, we can equip a family with one of these with a more conventional bucket. Let's see. Is this, is this on? Yes, sir. Uh, there we go. Okay, so uh, the bucket ministry, as you can see, that child is literally drinking muddy water. Uh, and this is what they've got. Uh, you can see more pictures in the back. But um, the, uh, one day I was talking to Chris Beth, the founder, and um, there was a crisis going on where people were short of water. And he said, Lon, we are not a humanitarian organization. We are an evangelistic organization. And um, next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like you to look at the latest report. Um, each one of these um, filters has a, um, a zebra code on it and a GPS device. And uh, so they keep track of how many filters were distributed just last week, how many follow-ups they did, um, how many received Christ, 140 received Christ in one week, um, how many home discipleships there were, and there didn't happen to be any baptisms that week. Next slide. Uh, I didn't, I, I saw this for the first time last week. Uh, this is their, their more, uh, uh, this is where the, the ministries mostly are. Uh, they ha there are other places, but uh, you can see that everything from Honduras to Guatemala to Panama, Brazil, Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda, and the Uganda slum. Uh, I didn't know that they had started another ministry in a slum in Uganda. Um, and the Kabira slum is our biggest project. You can see 95,000 people were assessed. Um, 14,700 filters were handed out in one week. Next slide. Oh, and by the way, that showed 61 baptisms in 10 months. Um, these are the people that are doing it. Um, typically, a salary in um, uh, <clears throat> Kabira is about $26 a month. And so uh, we've hired these people. They're all residents of uh, Kabira themselves. They live here. They were drinking that bad water. Um, and we, they, we send them out in teams of two so that they uh, uh, can, one can be uh, sharing the other, that provide them a little bit of security. Uh, but they share Christ with the uh, families. They go back three times after handing out a filter. Next. Uh, this is my buddy uh, Josco. I met him uh, a few years ago while I was traveling in Kenya. Uh, he joined the Kabira team and also the Kenya team. And here you can see him preaching. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> the Bucket Ministry partners with uh, a lot of other organizations. But what really excites me is uh, since Chris was here last, they've started a uh, kids club. And Kids Club is just fantastic because uh, these children have no place to play, uh, no place to uh, uh, get away from the horrible conditions that they live in. Next slide. Um, here you can see the children are uh, learning how to use the bucket filter as part of the ministry program. Uh, for, 100 and, or for $75 uh, every two weeks, uh, we bring in uh, about 150 children uh, to uh, 
uh, learn how to use the filter and spend a week learning about Christ and having games and, uh, and activities to help uh, brighten their day. Next slide. Um, I was asked uh, by Joe Fraser to read this to you, so I'm going to read this. Um, he wanted me to tell you this story. A kind and thoughtful grandmother in our congregation brought her two elementary school age children to church the Sunday before Chris Best spoke. They uh, heard my challenge that one dime a day for a year would purchase the filter equipment needed for a family uh, need for 20 years. That's a great and obtainable investment to dedicate ourselves for this year, I told both services. The next week, Lil Caldwell directed me to this grandmother with a Ziploc bag full of dimes. She told me her grandsons were challenged by the uh, request and informed her after church, Grandma, we can do this next week. And they did. Scouring drawers in their homes and grandmas, they came up with $52. Too often we look at a challenge as too daunting or troubling, while others, like these boys, can take it on as a can-do project. There you go. What are we waiting for? And that's from your missions chairman, uh, Joe Fraser. Next slide, please. Uh, so in Kibera, with 400,000 people living there, um, there's potentially 200,000 children that we can minister to. And I mean, what greater ministry can there be than to, than to introduce Christ to children that are in such a tight living quarters, have so much motivation, so much reason to want to get involved in Christ. So you can follow uh, the Bucket Ministry uh, by going to thebucketministry.org. You can um, see the, uh, um, uh, the flyers out back. Uh, there's a uh, kids club that you can designate or you can uh, just offer... Uh, for the filters themselves. Next slide. So my prayer has been that uh, churches in Colorado is going to catch this vision. This is primarily funded out of Texas, uh, but I'd like to see Colorado become the number two in any way uh, organization. Currently we need $1,600 a month for uh, 150 children per month. Uh, that's only just short of $11 per, uh, per child. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Hey, gang. Pray over Lon and this entire ministry and 150 kids, $1,600 a month. That's, that's, that's within reach. It's within reach for the people of God to meet that need. And so let's pray about how God would have us direct our personnel and our resources, our abundance, um, and what the Lord would have us to do. Heavenly Father, thank you for Lon, and thank you for the bucket ministry. Thank you that you gave a vision to Chris Beth many years ago to take clean water to people. And as clean water is going to people, also taking the living water to people. And so, God, we, we just pray for a continued blessing. The numbers on the screen tell a story, a magnificent story that you are using this ministry to bring people into the kingdom, and we ask for more. We ask that you would show us our part to play, how you would have us to be involved, how you would have us to invest. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Once again, make some noise for Lon, if you will. Thank you. All right, church, you want to stand up, and we'll... Keep worshiping God together.
to your heart, loving the world, hating the dark. I want to see dry bones living again, singing as one. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am. Worthy, none beside Thee, God Almighty, the Great I Am, the Great I Am, the Great I Am, the Great I Am. shake before him the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great i am the great i am the great i am Before him, the demons run and flee at the mention of the name King of Majesty. There is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. The great I
hold me now in the hands I create in the heaven. Find me now where the grace runs as deep as your scars. You pulled me from the clay, you set me on a rock. You called me by your name, made my heart whole again. Lift it up, and my knees know it's all for your glory. I might stand with more reasons to sing than to fear. You pulled me from the set me on a rock you called me by your name made my heart whole again here i stand high and surrender i need you now hold my heart now and forever my soul the grounds where the great did all my shame remains left for dead in your way you crashed those age old days you left no stone unturned you stepped out of that grave you shouldered me all the way surrender I need you now hold my heart now and forever my soul cries out once I was broken to love my whole heart through sin has no hold on me as your grace holds me
Chains are now. Death has no hold on me, cause your grace owns that ground. Your grace owns me now. Your grace owns me now. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you today as we prepare to open your word, having worshipped you, and we say thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together in this way. We ask that you would speak to your people in these moments from your word. Minister to our needs and receive our worship. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And go ahead and have a seat. If you are new around here and we didn't meet before the service, my name is Matt, and we're going to be in Revelation chapter 11 today, um, and pray for me. My voice, my voice is going out, and i got to make it through two services, um, and so I am going to attempt to speak a little softer than I normally might, but we probably both know how that's going to go. Um, it'll last for about two seconds. And then I'll get excited about something. So, uh, Revelation chapter 11. If you remember, the week before Easter, uh, we began in this passage together. And now we're going to walk through it a little more slowly. So let's just dump, jump right into the deep end of the pool uh, and read the first couple of verses. Then I was given a measuring rod. This is John speaking. Like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. If you're looking for time frames, which uh, Revelation is not written necessarily in a chronological fashion, even though there are many chronological aspects to it, um, we are probably approaching what we believe to be the midpoint of this time of tribulation. There's a little bit of a a break of the main events taking place that we're studying in Revelation. Revelation 10 to 12 is a little bit different. Um, They are still a main idea. It's not a rabbit trail, but it veers off um, the main chronological timeline if you're working that way through Revelation. So the Great Tribulation is coming. The time known as Jacob's Trouble and the final bowls of wrath are going to be poured out on the earth. So here's what we talked about last time. First, we reminded ourselves of some helpful keys in studying and reading the book of Revelation. Uh, Then we looked at the first few verses, some of the ones that we just read, and we read how John was told to measure the temple. The problem being that there is not a temple there today, is there? And some of you have been to Israel, some of you went a few months ago, some of you uh, will travel there next year, Lord willing, when we go in May of next year. The problem is there's not a temple. And so you have some (coughs) options. Option number one, this is figurative. And the temple is the body of Christ in the tribulation. Option number two, this is literal. And there is a third temple to be built. The issue, of course, with this, and again, you'll see this if you go to the Holy Land, um, the third holiest site in all of Islam sits on the Temple Mount Today, what is that called? The Dome of the Rock. That's correct. We'll see a slide of that in a, in a few minutes. It is believed to be holy for many reasons. This is interesting, um, but primarily because it's believed to be the place where Muhammad ascended to heaven. The Dome of the Rock is a shrine. Next to the Dome of the Rock is a mosque known as the Al-Aqsa Mosque. If you've been paying attention to world news, 
you would have seen that there were great riots and trouble there on the Temple Mount this week between Israeli security forces and Muslim worshipers and, and other people, okay? And so te- great tension is here. More tension probably is here in this place than anywhere else in the world. Okay, that is what is there now. Shrine and mosque sitting next to each other on the Temple Mount. So just for quick review, historically, look at this next slide. The first temple was built sometime around 957 BC. That was built by Solomon, the son of David. Um, It was destroyed in 586 to 587 BC uh, by the Babylonians. And then the second temple was built in 516 BC by Zerubbabel and modified by whom? Many years later. Because it was called what? It's called Herod's temple. So Herod came along, increased the size of it, made modifications to it, made it this glorious, glorious building um, in his time. <clears throat> it was destroyed by who? Second temple was destroyed by the Romans under the leadership of a man named Titus. Titus, whose father at the time was emperor of Rome, destroyed the temple, raised it to the ground in 70 AD. Titus's goal was that Jerusalem would be so destroyed that no one would even remember the name of Jerusalem. Um, Because Jerusalem became a pagan and Christian city, no no temple mount, um, had no temple on it for a couple hundred years. So after Titus destroyed the temple, there's no temple on the mountain. For a couple hundred years, no temple was rebuilt because Rome was ruling and Rome decided that Jerusalem would not be a Jewish city, but Rome is going to make Jerusalem a Christian city. So the temple doesn't get rebuilt. Now, all this is important for what we're going to read here in Revelation in a moment. Why, well, thank you very much, Randy. We'll see how much it helps. Um, So Jerusalem has no temple for hundreds of years under the reign of the Roman Empire. Jews were not even allowed in Jerusalem for a long time. So there can't be a temple be rebuilt because there's nobody there to rebuild it. Eventually, a man named Muhammad comes on the scene in the Middle East and thinking himself a prophet of God, conquers the city of Mecca and much of the Arabian Peninsula, but not all of it. That would happen after Muhammad. Um, He dies in 632. After Muhammad, and this is the next thing that happens, you see the Rashidun Caliphate took over Jerusalem in 636 to 637 A.D., Okay, so you go from Roman rule, Byzantine rule, to Muslim rule. And you have this caliphate uh, ruling over Jerusalem at this time. About 50 years after they came into power, the Dome of the Rock was built, which still stands there today. Um, And the beginnings of the mosque that sit next to it began at this time as well, started off as merely like a prayer chapel. So for the last 1,500 years, this area has been under Muslim control, except for a brief period during the Crusades when the Knights Templar turned it into a palace and stables for their horses for a season. So there's no temple today, all right? You know that. You've seen the pictures even if you haven't been there. There's no temple up there. Um, Not only that, but there is a giant mosque and shrine. So let's look at this picture. This is what you see today. You see the Dome of the Rock up here, and then down here is the great Al-Aqsa Mosque, sitting on top of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, where Solomon's Temple and Herod's Temple once sat. There has been no temple for almost 2,000 years in Jerusalem, but we're studying a book today, and we're reading of God wreaking havoc on those who dwell on the earth. We talked about this phrase a few months ago, uh, a few weeks ago, rather. Uh, World systems are in flux in a way that they never have been before. Um, Is it too great a thing to imagine for us that with all of the upheaval in the book of Revelation that the land could not be cleared for the third temple? So for me, 
right? Interpretively, when I read about a temple in the book of Revelation, I don't think it's too great a stretch to say that there is going to be a physical third temple in the book of Revelation. I don't think that's too great a leap, even though there hasn't been for 2,000 years. I think things are happening that where we could see that happen. Why does this matter? Why does it matter that there's not been a temple for 2,000 years, but there could be a physical temple um, at some time in the future in the book of Revelation? I believe because of the way this may be done. Now you think about this. What separates the beliefs of Christian believers and Jewish believers? What separates Christians from Jews? We're both monotheists. We both believe in the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. We both believe that there is one God and his name is Yahweh. The difference between Jews and Christians, and there are a lot of commonalities, correct? What is the difference? You got it. Specifically, not just Jesus, but we believe Jesus to be who? Son of God, the promised one, the Messiah. The anointed one, the promised one of God. The all the one, the law and the prophets spoke of. We believe that Jesus of Nazareth is Messiah. It's God's anointed one. Jews do not believe that. Jews do not believe Messiah has come, but when he does, they believe he will do what? Do you know? Rebuild the temple. Okay? This is so important. Because we can see the pieces coming together here. It's very possible that there will be a great deception by someone who will come on the scene and promise peace and rebuild the temple. And many will fall under his influence. That person is likely to be known as the Antichrist. So we have a temple. No matter how we, how we get there in the book of Revelation, we have, it, we have a temple, I believe. After John is told to measure the temple but not the court of the Gentiles, we're introduced to these two witnesses who speak for God. They carry God's authority and a prophetic ministry as they preach repentance for three and a half years, empowered by the Holy Spirit. God will protect them during this time as they are spiritual light in an increasingly dark world. The most important thing about these witnesses that we saw is that they are empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's not the fantastic things that they do. Those are important as well, but the most important thing about them is that they're empowered (coughs) by the Holy Spirit. They have power and authority because they're empowered by the third person of the Trinity, who is interested, by the way, in working in your life and my life as well. So we read this fantastic stuff in the book of Revelation. It should cause us to say the same Holy Spirit that works through them wants to work through me and indwells me if I'm a believer. You have the same Spirit of God working in you. Are you operating in the power of the Spirit? These are the questions we should be asking. Am I walking by the Spirit? Am I living by the Spirit? Daily putting to death the deeds of the flesh and those attitudes. So you don't come to church on Sundays, in other words, to get topped off with the Spirit. But that's the way a lot of us treat the Holy Spirit. Like we need to gather again and get filled up with the Holy Spirit because we run out during the week. This is not true. You don't run out of a person. You run out of water. You can't run out of a person. You have the Holy Spirit if you're a follower of Jesus living in you. So um, we come together because we're encouraging one another to go live by the Spirit during the week, because the Spirit of God is not a thing. He's a person inexhaustibly linked to your spirit, and he walks with you. We gather to celebrate, to encourage one another, to spur each other on to good deeds in Christ Jesus. So verse three says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses. They will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood, to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit... (coughs) will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom in Egypt where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies, watch this, and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb 
And those who dwell on the earth, there's that phrase again, will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents. That's pretty depraved. Because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on them, on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified. And gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. So there are two questions that we're going to address today. And it may not be to everyone's satisfaction, but here are the two questions that we are going to tackle. Number one, about these witnesses. Who are they and why are they sent? This is what's important to us. And the second question is more important than the first. The why is more important than the who here, okay? Um, but who are they? Well, there's a couple of options here, but we need to understand that the main idea is not identity here, right? The book of Revelation here is not as concerned with the identity of these two men or two witnesses as they are of what they are called to do. Um, so the Holy Spirit through John is not primarily concerned with you and I whipping out our notebooks and writing down in the margins as we do the identity of these. Could it be this person? Could it be this person? Could, could it be this person? These are the things we do. There's nothing wrong that it is good to dive deep and discover and to pray and seek and gather more information. And that's not to say that something of their identity is not key to our understanding of the text and God's future plan for the world, because it is. But when we read Revelation 11, I believe the language and the image that we're given is meant to draw our attention to two Old Testament prophets. And whether they are those prophets specifically or not, the text doesn't really address. But what is addressed is that the, the, the language that is used calls us to think of these prophets. These two witnesses that we see in Revelation are at least symbolically modeled, at least symbolically modeled after the ministry of Moses and Elijah. So a couple things that we see here. Number one, they have the power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain. That's the same power that we see associated with the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 17. The story of Elijah was well known in the first century when the book of Revelation was written. So you think about when James, the brother of Jesus, is also writing in this time period to early Christians, and he is teaching them about the power of the prayer of righteous people. Here's what he said in James chapter 5, verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. See, James is not teaching the early church a new story. It's one that they all knew quite well. Say, hey, remember Elijah. Remember the great prophet Elijah. He was just a regular guy like us, a nature like us. And he prayed fervently <coughs> that it might not rain. And for three, three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. The same period of time that we read about all throughout the book that we are currently studying. All right, so they have the power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain. Number two, they have the power to turn the waters to blood and strike the earth with plagues. This is the same power that we see from Exodus chapter 7, where Moses, acting prophetically on behalf of the God of Israel, turned the Nile to blood and saw the subsequent plagues rain down on the kingdom of Egypt, who was holding the people of God in captivity. Okay? Number three, they have the power to consume their enemies with fire. What is this? This is an echo of the power of God that we see in 2 Kings chapter 1, where Elijah repeatedly calls fire down from heaven to consume the soldiers of an evil king who worshiped the Lord of Flies, Baalzebub. So these two witnesses, regardless of whether they are Moses and Elijah or are coming in the same spirit and power of Moses and Elijah. Here is the message to us. This is, so, this is the part that is absolutely clear that I believe we can take to the bank. When you think of these two witnesses, think of the deeds and think of the ministry of Moses and Elijah. Whether they are Moses and Elijah or whether they are two new coming in the spirit and the form in the same manner in which God used Moses and Elijah, this is what God is saying to us. They are going to be used in the same manner as Moses and Elijah of the Old Testament. The Jews had, in the first century, long believed that both Moses and Elijah would come, would somehow return before the end of time. 
Um, Mark 9, after the transfiguration, the disciples are asking Jesus about this very thing. Right? Uh, essentially, they're saying, why do the other teachers say that Elijah is going to come back? Why do people believe this, Jesus? And, and I want you to see something that I believe is very, very important. I want you to turn, if you've got a copy of God's Word, especially if it's a paper copy, this is very cool. Um, but even if it's on your phone, that's fine. I want you to turn to the last verses in the Old Testament. Go to the last verses in the Old Testament. That is, of course, what book? <laughs> Those will be the crispy pages in your Bible. Some of you just discovered it's Malachi. There's no shame here. We're not shaming you. Malachi is the last prophet in the Old Testament time period. All right, now I want you to look at the last three verses in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, starting in verse 4. They're on the screen as well. Remember the law of my servant Moses. This is the last thing God has to say in the Old Testament. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Remember Moses. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter desolation. So pretty sure the disciples did not quite get this when they were talking about it. But Jesus clears up the mystery for us elsewhere in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 11, verses 11 to 14, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women there is arisen no one greater than who? Jesus speaking, he says, the greatest person who's ever lived is my cousin, John the Baptist. Okay, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and all the law, all the prophets and the law, Moses, Elijah, prophet, law, prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, listen to Jesus. He is Elijah who is to come. Who has ears to hear let him hear. Now, was John the Baptist Elijah reincarnated? Help me here. We should be able to answer this with some confidence. No. But Jesus just said, he who has ears, let him hear. I tell you that Elijah has come. And it's this guy. Is it Elijah come back in disguise? No. Of course not. It's that John the Baptist came in the same manner as Elijah. A powerful prophet from God. But I also believe that there's a future fulfillment of the coming of this Elijah. Uh, this Elijah figure. Why? Because Malachi prophesied that he would become before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the Elijah prophecy is going to be fully fulfilled here in Revelation chapter 11, I believe. Before the second coming of the Lord Jesus. So either God is going to send Elijah back for a special assignment toward the end. And some of you are saying, that just sounds crazy. Listen, let's just be honest with each other. Revelation sounds crazy. This isn't more crazy than anything else we've studied so far. Right? It's okay for us to say, I can't imagine how all this is going to happen. Right? But I can look at the world and say things are moving at breakneck speed. For some type of culmination, God's up to something. So whether God sends Elijah back for a special assignment or someone is going to come just as John the Baptist did in the spirit, in the manner of Elijah to be used in a similar way as Elijah. And the same is true of the second character that we see in Revelation chapter 11. So again, why are they sent? Or who are, who, who are they? Why are they sent? Okay. Um, so fascinating, isn't it, that the last thing that God says to us through the Old Testament prophets is right here. Right? Malachi. What does he say to us? Number one, remember the law through Moses. 
Mount Horeb that we just read about here is Mount Sinai. God's telling the people, even though you're a tough-necked, crooked, perverse generation of people, the way forward is simple. He's saying this in the book of Malachi. Remember what I've done for you. You have neglected me. You've neglected my law. You've neglected to tithe and be generous. That's, the me- that's part of the message of Malachi. Like if you guys would get the Ten Commandments, you'd be generous people. But you don't. You don't love God more than everything else. And so you're stingy people. You don't trust. That's the message of Malachi. It's just remember the law. Remember what I told you through Moses. You've neglected all these things. Corruption and justice are running rampant in Jerusalem. You guys have not listened or obeyed my law or my prophets. Remember the law given through Moses. And then the second thing that he says here in Malachi is, I will send Elijah before the Lord comes. So every year at Passover, this is fascinating, every year at Passover in a Jewish home, four cups of wine are presented and then drank. But there's a fifth cup that is only presented and is never drank. It's eventually poured out. And the fifth cup, does anybody know what it's called? The fifth cup is called Elijah's cup. Um, It's a ceremonial cup of wine Porn during the family Seder meal on Passover. It's left untouched in honor of Elijah, who according to Jerusalem, to tradition, will arrive one day as an unknown guest to announce the coming of the Messiah, the Redeemer of Israel. So during the Passover celebration, uh, usually a child from the home goes to the door, opens the door, and invites Elijah to come into the home. They pour him a glass of wine. And they wait. So it's really beautiful. And then they sing a song. At every Passover Seder, the traditional song, I'm going to butcher this, by the way. Eli Yehu Hanavi. And this is what they would sing. There's, there's a couple different parts to it. There are five lines. Eli Yehu Hanavi. That means Elijah the prophet. Eli Yehu Hatishbi. Elijah the Tishbite. Eliehu Hagiladi, Elijah the Gileadite, Bim Hera Yavav Ilenu, may he soon come to find us, Im Mashiach ben David, with the Messiah, son of David. So who, 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 are, who are these men? Well, they come in the spirit and the form of Elijah and Moses in the book of Revelation, just as it was promised in the closing verses of the Old Testament. Why are they sent? Well, based generally on the Old Testament prophets and specifically on the Malachi text that we looked at, Jews have commonly believed that Elijah and Moses would somehow return before the end of time. Um, That's exactly why the disciples were asking Jesus about this after the transfiguration. Right? They'd seen Moses and Elijah and Jesus and everybody's glowing and it's fantastic. And they're coming down the mountain. They're like, Teacher, why do, why, why do we teach and why do we believe that Elijah is going to come back? And, and, and again, they didn't understand it, but Jesus cleared up the mystery. And he says, okay, it's not Elijah the man. It's the spirit of Elijah. And it's, it's in John the Baptist. He's, he's already come. And the same, again, is true in Revelation 11. Now, back to the book of Revelation What we see here happening in Revelation chapter 11 is that these two men came, they prophesied, people hated them because they prophesied, um, and they were, what? What happened to them? What happens to the two guys in Revelation? They're brutally murdered. They're martyred. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of Jerusalem. And for three and a half days... They will be displayed, and the Bible says it will be like Christmas for people around the world because God's prophets are dead. What kind of evil is this when the righteous ones of God are murdered and people cheer? Does that seem so foreign to the world that you and I live in today? No, and so when we read Revelation, we say, I don't see how that could happen. I see how that could happen. I absolutely see how that could happen. They will celebrate a new holiday called Dead Saints Day. People will go to stores and buy gifts and wrap them up and give them to their children because God's prophets have been murdered and we're watching it on TV. 
That's how perverse things are. This is remarkably the only real rejoicing that we see in the book of Revelation. But as is always the case, so pay attention, this is so clear and so true. God does not let evil have the last word. God will never let evil have the last word. Evil does not get the last word in history. Evil does not get the last word in your life. When God is the God of your story, he personally writes the ending, weaving together the parts that are impossible for you and I to understand until at long last, someday, you and I will see that indeed all things have worked together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Evil will not have the last word. This is perfectly demonstrated in Revelation chapter 11. Now again, we've talked about who they might be, but why are they? Why are they here? Why are they sent? What is God up to here? Look back at, in, in the word. Verse 11. After the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they hear a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Seven thousand people is a lot, but not in comparison to the untold masses who have died throughout Revelation thus far. And things are going to only ramp up from here. But watch what happened. These, these two men were killed. These two witnesses were killed, resurrected, and then they ascended to heaven. Thousands die in Jerusalem, but what happens to those who are left behind? What happens to those who are left in Jerusalem after the 7,000 die and the two witnesses are murdered, resurrected, and ascend to heaven? They give glory to the God of heaven. This is the key. Right Here it is. Giving glory to the God of heaven is a mark of real, genuine worship. What we're reading here, I believe, is a harvesting of souls. This is what we're seeing here in Revelation 11, is the fulfillment of one of the promises of God. Now I want you to see this with me. Um, it was not their power, it was not the fire from their mouths. It was not the ability to turn water to blood. It was not the ability to call down plagues upon people where we see men and women turn to Christ, was it? Have you read of conversion in Revelation chapter 11 before this? I have not. What did it? When did people turn to Jesus? It was their martyrdom, their resurrection, and their ascension. In other words, it was their martyrdom and God's rescue of them, his redemption of them. A ministry of fire breathing did not turn the masses to Christ. But their sacrifice did, and God's power in their lives did. Listen, I'm not going to go off and preach on this, but that will preach all day long. It is not the power in us that people come to Christ. It's not, a, it's not oh, how impressive is it? That man can breathe fire. He turned water into blood. Like, I mean, that's what we crave and want. We want the signs and wonders. We want the power and the authority. But what does God use? A couple of dead prophets murdered by the world. And that's what brought revival. If that's not a message for us in our day, in our generation, I don't know what is. And this is, this is the example of Jesus. Listen, in one of the, we read this, and one of the elders said to me, weep no more, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David is conquered. And all of us are like, yes! So he can open the scroll and it's seven seals. We're like, yes, the lion of Judah. That's my guy. That's my savior. In between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. See, he heard a lion, 
But he saw a lamb, a lamb slain for the sins of the world. Isn't that always the way? Have we not in our lives been more moved by the sacrifice of men and women who spent themselves humbly for the glory of King Jesus? Have we not been inspired by the example of men like the first Christian martyr Stephen who was murdered in Jerusalem just a year maybe or two after Jesus' death? Have we not been inspired by men like Richard Wormbrand who was imprisoned in Romania? From 1948 to 1965, and upon his release, started a ministry. Today we know his voice of the martyrs. When he was asked how he could love those who were torturing him, this is how he responded. He said, by looking at men not as they are, but as they will be. Is it the great and powerful leaders of the world? Or is it the Cassie Bernals and the Rachel Scotts? who most often lead us to the feet of Jesus. You know this to be true. God uses the absurd weakness of humanity and sacrifices the greatest imitation we can offer the lamb who was slain. And these witnesses will sacrifice everything for Jesus. Now, we have... As is always the case when we read Scripture, we get, the, we get the page after the event. So these two guys who are going to be murdered for Jesus, we have no idea if they know about the fact, well, I guess they do because they're in the future. They are going to lay their lives down for Jesus. It is their sacrifice, and these witnesses are going to do that, which, by the way, is the point. Now, here's, here's where it all comes together, I believe. Moses and Elijah, law and the prophets. All for what? All for what? Remember, Moses, they were told, remember the law. And Paul tells us why. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. Therefore, the law, Moses, has become our tutor to do what? To lead us to who? To Christ. To Jesus. So that we may be justified by faith. The law, the Old Testament law, Always pointing to who? To Jesus. Preparing the people for what? For Jesus, the Messiah. The coming of the King. But the second message, remember Elijah. Remember the great prophet, look for him. And then one came in the spirit of Elijah in the New Testament doing what? Matthew 3. In those days, John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Here's what he was preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. You remember what he was crying? Prepare the way of the Lord. Make the path straight. All the law points to one man, Jesus. All the prophets came to point to one man, to Jesus. So why is it when we get to the book of Revelation, because it's in the future, clouded by all this imagery, do we all of a sudden forget that the law and the prophets were to point to Jesus? So the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, one representing law, one representing prophets, what are they here for? To point people to Jesus. Jesus. Why the witnesses? So that even in the midst of perversity and the horror at the midpoint of what we believe is the tribulation, these men come to point people to the God who loves them. Jesus did not win salvation for humanity through his might. He won through actually dying for the very enemies who killed him which you and I would find ourselves in that category. Our message to the world is the same. God loves you immensely. Repent. The king is coming. We say it with our words. We say it with our lives by laying them down in service of the king. For him to do as he sees fit with us. There was a first coming of Jesus. The law and the prophets came to point to him. 
to ready the people for the Messiah. Revelation chapter 11 says these two witnesses will be coming, preaching, demonstrating all the things that the law and the prophets did in the Old Testament. Doing what? To prepare the world for the coming of Christ. So dear ones, as we wrap up our time together, can I encourage you with this word? All of this is for something. Now, all of this is for something. And the something that all of this is for is the return of the king. He is coming back. And our lives in this day should do the same as these guys in that day, minus the fire breathing and plagues. It's to tell people God loves them and to repent. Because the king is coming. And we should do the same thing that God's people have always been called to do. It's just a point. It's just a point. Jesus is coming. Jesus is returning. Time is short. Know this. He is coming. May we be ready when he does. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Thanking you for this encouragement from your word. Even in these hard chapters, these difficult, challenging chapters of your word, you are clear to us. You are on your way to us. And this is not for nothing. We love you dearly. May we live for you faithfully. For you have given generously to us and given us the gift of faith and your spirit. Redeeming us and changing us into a people who can live for you because you live inside of us. This is the good and beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Stan Church. that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now the Savior knelt to wash our feet now at his feet we bow Your name, your name is this.
Thank you, team. Hey, as you go, um, just a couple of quick announcements for you. Number one, if you're a guest, we're having a, our uh, Next Steps lunch directly after the second service. So even if you haven't let us know you were coming, there's going to be plenty of food and only be together for an hour or so. Uh, we're just going to talk through what it looks like to connect with the different ministries, small groups, and opportunities here at Ridgeline. would love to have you be a part of that. Um, and then also next Sunday evening. 5.30. If you have any interest in going with us to the Holy Land next year, um, I want to invite you to a meeting. Come, see some pictures, hear some stories, eat some hummus, 
ask your questions um, because we would love to go there together. I believe this is an opportunity uh, that can really change just the way that you read and experience Scripture. And everybody who has the opportunity, uh, I think, will be blessed by it. So I invite you to come uh, next Sunday evening, 530. There is a sign-up for that out in the hall just to let us know that you'll be coming to make sure that we prepared enough materials for you. And then finally, May 22nd will be Be the Church Sunday. We're excited about that. So many of you have signed up already, both online and out in the hall, but I want to invite you to do that. We'll come together on May 22nd during the 9 o'clock hour, worship for a few moments, and then we're going to head into the community to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. And this is an all hands on deck. There is something for everyone, a way for all of us to participate. So if you would sign up for that out in the hall or use the sign up genius that was emailed to you uh, this last week as well. As you go, hear God's word over you, but as for you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Go in the grace and peace of our Savior. I love you. We'll see you next time. Sun's not worried about the winter, cause soon it will pass. The light's not thinking about the darkness or the shadow it cast. A heart that's planted in forgiveness doesn't dwell in the past. So why should I be? Cause you take good care.
on each side we will not lose sight of the one who's greater one name one name holds every victory one voice that silences the enemy one king who reigns for all Yeah. 